Oh my God, can we just fight for a country with a fair justice system, please? Where the rule of law applies to everyone equally and laws make sense? Bad guys should be bad guys no matter what color they are, what state they're in, or what radio show they host. You know what I'm saying? Sheesh. It's exhausting to watch. Hello, and welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan, and thank you for caring enough about democracy to join me. Let's get into it. So if you listened to the news last week, you know that Chris Christie has a new book out and is on a media blitz to be taken seriously in politics again by criticizing just the right amount of people without actually taking a shot at the people who are a real danger. A Republican congressman whose entire family came out during his election to say he's an unhinged, dangerous person who has no business being in office was censured by the House after he tweeted an anime video of him murdering AOC. Kevin McCarthy, the Republican House Minority Leader, did an eight-hour speech about nothing. The Democrats' approval ratings are apparently cratering because of inflation. And Kyle Rittenhouse, the boy who went to a protest armed with an AR-15 and ended up shooting three people and killing two, was found not guilty and offered three congressional internships on the same day. Matt Gates, the Florida congressman awaiting charges of child sex trafficking, and Paul Gosar, the same Arizona representative who threatened to kill AOC, even got into some witty back and forth about arm wrestling for the right to have Rittenhouse on their staff. Now, what you might have missed the same day Chris Christie was plastered on every news station across the country is Joe Biden and the Democrats signing into law an incredibly comprehensive infrastructure bill that will invest billions of dollars in our roads, bridges, public transit, trains, and airports, as well as giving all Americans clean drinking water and the internet. And while you were watching Kevin McCarthy posture his performative outrage for an entire workday to give sound bites to right-wing media, you might have missed that what he was actually doing was attempting to hold back a vote on the Build Back Better Act, the largest expansion of the social safety net for the American people in decades, and yet another groundbreaking bill the House Democrats were ready to pass. Kevin was hoping his speech would push the voting until late enough in the evening that he could say, look, the Democrats are trying to push this giant spending bill through in the dead of night, but it didn't work. Ultimately, the Democrats just sat through his ridiculous speech, recessed, and like grown-ups with executive functioning skills, reconvened the next morning to pass the bill. Finally, while you were outraged, or perhaps thrilled, that white America was essentially just told by the Rittenhouse verdict that they can now shoot and kill protesters without consequence as long as you say it was self-defense, you might have overlooked that the bill the Democrats came back to pass includes things like universal pre-K for all Americans, subsidized childcare for lower and middle class families, the largest federal investment in housing in the country's history, expanded family leave so you don't lose your job or your paycheck if a family member gets sick or a new baby comes, the continuation of the child tax credit that has already single-handedly cut child poverty in this country by 40%, the lowering and capping of many essential prescription drug prices, and billions of dollars to finally start fighting the existential crisis that is climate change. But Paul Gosar did retweet the video of him killing AOC again, so you might have missed all that. What are we doing here, America? To hear the media tell it, the Democrats are in deep trouble, failing on every count. Our VP is hated and says words wrong. Our president is literally asleep on the job, and it is inevitable that Republicans will regain power in the next election. Um, in what reality? Why do we continue to let this narrative gain traction? Sure, I could go on about what will happen in 22 if the Democrats don't pass some serious voter protections and counterbalance the Republican voter suppression laws and extreme partisan gerrymandering, basically looking to silence Democratic and minority voices across America. But that's for its own episode. For now, let's just take another look at this past week. Our first female vice president had an incredibly productive meeting with the president of France, who until recently we had a pretty rough relationship with after we kind of screwed them over on a submarine deal. America hosted Mexico and Canada at the White House in a very successful North American Leader Summit. The president signed a bill that will make the biggest investment in our country's infrastructure in over 50 years, creating millions of jobs, patching up our country, and getting us back on track to living up to our first world status. And after the minority leader finished his adult tantrum, the House passed the Build Back Better Act, a bill written expressly to help families and working people in America. In what world are the Democrats failing? The fact is, by almost every discernible metric, unemployment numbers, retail sales, job creation, COVID deaths, COVID hospitalizations, vaccine rollout, school openings, the stock market, and yes, the newly passed and signed infrastructure bill, this country is light years ahead of where it was only 10 months ago. For some perspective, 
At this time in Trump's presidency, he had signed zero major pieces of legislation, even though the Republicans had larger majorities in the House and the Senate. So can we please stop buying into this ridiculous narrative spun by the media and hyped by the opposition and realize that we have a government right now that is not only efficient and functioning, but succeeding beyond all previous administration records. Look, if you're a money guy, the stock market has literally never been higher. If you're a service worker, your government just voted to give you paid family leave, subsidized childcare, and cap major prescription drug prices. If you're a young person, we're finally starting to take climate change seriously. If you're old, the Democrats just voted to include hearing aids in Medicare. My God, why are we out here talking about the disgraced ex-governor of New Jersey and how he may or may not support Trump or may or may not run for president? Who cares? We already have a president. And if you stop listening to the media spin for one second, you might realize he's kind of kicking ass. Democrats need to stop being such sad sacks. Our party is doing well. It's doing incredibly well. Yes, it's huge and diverse and divided and messy, but that, my friends, is democracy. Our representatives are not supposed to all get along. They're supposed to represent our party's values and fight for their districts. They're not supposed to agree on everything, but they are supposed to agree to represent the country and work within the confines of our Constitution. We ended up with cooperation between AOC and Joe Manchin. Did it go exactly how we hoped? No. Are we annoyed? Of course. But the Democrats are a coalition. They have to bridge divides between corporatists, centrists, moderates, the squad. It's not easy. The Democrats basically have a working parliamentary system under the umbrella of the Democratic Party. You want more parties? They're already here. They're just all considered Democrats. Every normal political stance in American history you can think of is currently represented under the Democratic banner. And then there's that other party and whatever the fuck they're doing. Joe Biden was even able to deliver the bipartisanship that everyone, literally everyone, told him he was a fool to attempt. So is the Democratic Party perfect? No. There's a bunch of them on their high horse, a number unable to compromise, a handful that are far too old or out of touch, and a couple with some real power who basically are in it for themselves. But that diverse group of representatives is still out here getting stuff done. Things might be a real mess in America, but the party everyone keeps shitting on is the one that's actively trying to accomplish things. Like you can be salty because change isn't happening fast enough or you're not getting everything you were promised, but also maybe take a minute to acknowledge that even with ridiculously slim majorities, two senators that are bought and paid for and an out for blood obstructionist opposition, actual positive change is still occurring. Now, neither bill that was passed is perfect, so we're not going to pretend they are. The infrastructure bill was promised to be bipartisan and in making it so there's a lot of Republican compromises in it. The Build Back Better bill has already been negotiated within an inch of his life. So what started out as a $3.2 trillion investment in our people has now been whittled down by lobby groups and corporatists and sellouts to the $1.75 trillion package it is today. But even with all that, it's still a radical investment in the American people and a clear acknowledgement of the priorities of one party. If the Democrats were my child right now, I would be like, don't listen to what those assholes are saying about you. Are you doing a good job? Are you working hard? Are less people sick and dying because of you? Did you pass that bill to help the country? Yes, I know it's not perfect in all you wanted, but is it better than the bill the other guy had? Oh, they didn't have a bill? They hate your bill, but they have no alternative? Yeah, well, it is very easy to criticize something you cannot do yourself. Forget what they're saying. They're just trying to make you question yourself. You put your head down and you do the best work you can. People will notice. Now, what I want to ask is, if the health, the lives, and the livelihoods of the American people and the future success of the country, its infrastructure, and its position in the world are the priorities of the Democrats, based on the laws they just fought for and passed, what are the priorities of the party who fought and voted against all of that? What do the Republicans stand for? Not what did they used to stand for, small government, low taxes, family values. Not the Republican Party of the past. The Republican Party of today. What are their goals? What do they stand for? What do they think a congressional member's job is if not to pass legislation or look out for the American people? Have they decided to just pay representatives $178,000 a year to troll people on social media? Because that's what's happening. We have this one serious, boring, slow-moving party, and then we have this other party that is filling up with base and deeply broken people. The Republican Party of today is packed with liars and thieves and low lives, and the people whose ambition forces them to ignore, apologize for, or enable those people. I think the sooner we come to terms with the fact that the Republican Party we have in our minds is no longer the Republican Party of our reality, the sooner and better we'll be able to deal with the real issue, which is that the GOP is no longer a governing party. 
They're not trying to help the American people make legislation or do their jobs. Their entire platform is built around making sure the Democrats fail. Republican Representative Chip Roy recently said the quiet part out loud when he insisted the GOP just needs to sow chaos long enough to win 22. It's why they're working so hard to keep their base fearful and angry, why they're pushing vaccine disinformation, keeping up the big lie, and pandering to conspiracy theorists. They want America in turmoil. They're actively working against giving us what we need to function and thrive and live. They couldn't even care less if their own supporters die. They just need to make it to 22 where they believe they can take the house and they will never have to answer to the rule of law or democracy again. The brilliant lawyer and writer Terry Canefield points out that the Republican Party is both shrinking and becoming more dangerous. They go together. As the GOP openly embraces the crazies, the moderates are leaving, which means that leadership now has to cater to a radicalized base. Trump's appeal might be eroding in the grand scheme of the country, but Trump controls the base and the GOP needs the base, so Trump controls the GOP. This is why the leaders of the party are behaving increasingly erratically. They've stopped trying to actually govern and have shifted their entire MO to stopping progress and participating in some ongoing bizarre gotcha game where they spin false narratives for right-wing clickbait. It's why Republican superstars are not career politicians who get things accomplished, but social media influencers like Boebert and Green and Cawthorn and Gates. People who call for violence and uprisings and say shocking things and behave in despicable ways. These people are not legislators. They are elected crisis actors and professional shit disturbers, and they are the face of the new Republican Party. Stuart Stevens, who's a former Republican operative and advisor at the Lincoln Project and one of those moderates who left the party, puts it perfectly when he said, Republicans had years to pass an alternative to Obamacare. Never did it. Republicans had years to pass an infrastructure bill. Never did it. Governing isn't attacking the other side. Governing is getting shit done. And the Republican Party is not a governing party. From where I sit, I think they've realized they don't need to govern. They don't even want to govern. What they want is to rule. I've said this before, that the Republican Party has long known that they can no longer win on ideas. So they use the archaic electoral college system that favors them, their partisanly drawn congressional maps, their increasingly aggressive voter suppression, and a steady stream of fear and hate pumped into their base's consciousness to keep their voters fired up and coming out. But it's possible they won't even need their base if they take power in 22 and regain the presidency in 24. They are actively looking at countries like Hungary and Russia to emulate when they come back into power. The fact that Tucker Carlson recently took a trip to publicly hang out with Hungary's right-wing prime minister, Viktor Orban, and that the biggest conservative conference, CPAC, is planning to host its March conference in Hungary should be a warning to all of us. Michael Edison Hayden, a spokesperson for the Southern Poverty Law Center, says that the CPAC event in Hungary is clearly a threat. Because Orban's party has all but eliminated the free press and weakened democracy in that country to the point where it can hardly be considered a democracy anymore. Hayden says, there's no reason to bring CPAC to Hungary unless you're looking to make a clear statement that that is what you're looking to do in the United States. Republican representatives aren't looking out for their supporters. If they were, they would be encouraging them to protect themselves from a deadly virus and wouldn't have just voted against giving them clean water and better roads and bridges. They're using their supporters to regain power. And once they have it, what will stop them from changing the rules so they never lose again? You think Donald Trump, man of the golden penthouse, is going to care about the people in Appalachia and Alabama then? I don't think so. They're already making all the moves to cut the voter out of the equation. It's happening in real time if you care to see. That's why Republican leaders are so afraid to speak out. Because if it goes the way their party is aiming, they don't want to end up on the wrong side. Remember, this is the same group who overlooked the literal murder and dismemberment of an American journalist because it might interfere with their leader's personal arms deal. These are not scrupulous people. This is why we need to stop with the whole, woe is me, Democrats suck, why can't I get everything I want right now, bullshit. We are in a literal fight for the future of this nation, and we need to be united and resolute that this Republican Party, as they are now, should never hold power again. All right, so that was a lot. So let's take a little break for a segment I like to call Justice Being Served. This week was tough, but it wasn't all bad. Along with the aforementioned infrastructure bill and the past Build Back Better Act, Steve Bannon was arrested for failing to show up for his federal subpoena. Alex Jones will be held liable to the Sandy Hook parents for lying and saying their children didn't really die, and he's now begging for money to save InfoWars. 
We got a ton more information on Matt Gates's case, including that he used to play a lovely little Harry Potter themed game with his bros where they would get points for various sexual encounters, like sleeping in a sorority house, banging aides and interns and someone married, you know, like regular lawmaker stuff. But if any of them slept with this one particular female politician, you would win the whole game. So they called her the Golden Snitch. Apparently this game was the worst kept secret in Tallahassee, so. Lauren Boebert's ex-campaign manager and ally of Mike MyPillow Lindell was raided by the FBI in an election tampering probe. And it looks like the one guy who's been protecting Louis DeJoy at the post office is getting replaced. So it's possible that DeJoy will finally be ousted as postmaster general after trashing our entire mail service to fix an election, awarding contracts to himself, and breaking what he was in charge of so it could be privatized for profit. Go consequences! And we're back. And talking about the current right-wing Trump Republican Party and everything they stand for being an existential threat to the future of democracy. So, you know, like lighthearted stuff. To paraphrase famous Republican Dwight Eisenhower, if a political party's roots are not grounded in the desire to fight for a cause that is right and moral, then it is no longer a political party, but simply a conspiracy to seize power. The current Republican Party, or the GOP, are actively working to dismantle what this country stands for. They're done asking permission. They're done listening to voters. They're done living under the laws of this country. They just want to do what they want and have power and control above all else. And we cannot allow that. Forget the name Republican. Those values still exist in people who want to maintain democracy. And those values will still be around after we've saved democracy. But for now, you have to reject the people who would destroy it. You don't have to be a Democrat to vote for democratic values. You just might have to vote for them a couple of times until the ship writes itself. The party we know as Republicans have declared war on the rule of law, on fair elections, and on truth itself. And we have to tell them in no uncertain terms that this is not what America stands for, and they can rebuild their party on the ashes of their ambition. Between you and me, I think Trump's presidency and the devolvement of the Republican Party might have just been the painful wake-up call this country needed. Because democracy is not something you just get. It's something you work for. And Trump and the Republican Party are representative of the type of people democracy has always worked for. And like any spoiled child who has never been told no, they have become greedy and selfish and don't want to share power anymore. It's not enough to have the best seat at the table. They don't want anyone else at the table. And we cannot give that to them. I don't think this moment should even be about saving democracy. I think it should be about building democracy. Because if we're being honest, we have never really had a democracy that worked for all of us. We don't want to be great again because there is no point in history that it was ever great for all of us. That prioritizing of one group over another, that's how we got here. And when we get out of this, that is something we need to fix. A proper functioning democracy should always have room for diverse and contrasting views. That's what makes it fair and representative. But there should be no room for people who would work outside of the rules to benefit themselves or reject the rules completely in order to hold ultimate power. Steve Schmidt, my Republican brain crush, eloquently captured the threat on Twitter when he recently wrote, A tide of extremism has risen from the ashes of the failed American coup. The extremism in our country is growing and metastasizing, and it is a danger that cannot be underestimated, ignored, or wished away. The old boundaries have collapsed, and they will not return. So, essentially, stop pretending this giant crisis isn't happening because it is. And stop trying to normalize it because it makes you feel better. Accept reality so you are prepared to deal with reality. To this point, right after the insurrection, Chris Christie, the same Chris Christie trying to rehabilitate himself with a book calling out lying and disinformation, went on TV and gave the Trump presidency an A. He said, I know some things happened at the end of the presidency, but otherwise it was a total A. Oh, something happened at the end, Chris? Like the part where he tried to illegally overturn an election, riled up his followers so much that he ultimately instigated an armed insurrection of our capital that killed and maimed people, all after ignoring the biggest threat to American lives in generations, suppressing information coming out of the CDC that might have kept us safe, and allowed over half a million citizens to die on his watch? Something like that? But other than that, a total A? Yeah, that's a, that's a really grading on a curve there, man. But Christie's not alone. People want to pretend things are normal. That the Trump presidency and everything that happened after it is normal and sort of fits into the confines of our democratic system, but it doesn't, and it's not. And you can see that when every Republican leader has to bend over backwards to publicly prostrate themselves in their leader's favor and to shamelessly ignore and spin reality to fit their narrative. Are these Republican leaders so delusional and self-serving, so convinced that they will be able to cheat themselves to unstoppable power that they no longer care how obvious and shameless their lies are? I guess so. The question is, do we care? 
This capitulation to the basest part of their party, to the most gullible, the most uninformed, the most racist. Republican politicians have basically become Fox News the political party, just saying whatever it takes to keep the ratings up and the money rolling in. I keep thinking back to all those painful cabinet meetings where Trump went around the table and everyone tried to outdo each other kissing his ass. Oh, sir, it's such an honor to be in the room with such a brilliant political mind and, if I may say so, such a handsome and impressive man. <sighs> it's embarrassing. And here we are a year after he lost the election and they're still doing it? During Kevin McCarthy's eight-hour speech to nowhere, among other things, he threatened Adam Schiff, a Democratic congressman who was the leader of the first impeachment trial against Trump. McCarthy said when he gets the speaker's gavel, he'll be censuring Adam and removing him from all committees. For what? For following the law? To not bending justice so it goes around the wannabe dictator? Is that where we are now? Is that what the Republican Party wants us to be? I guess so, because McCarthy also told the House that when he's in charge, currently censured Republican members like Marjorie Taylor Greene, the congresswoman unable to sit on any committees because she actively traffics in racism and anti-Semitism and baseless conspiracy theories and currently owes the House over $60,000 in fines, and Paul Gosar, who was just removed from his committees for threatening to kill his co-worker, would not only be reinstated, but get better jobs. Again, for what, Kevin? Their insight, competence, and experience? No, because they've proved themselves to be loyal soldiers to the violent, hateful, authoritarian, curious party the Republicans have become. Someone I follow on Twitter recently said, if you want to know who you are, look around and see who you're with. The Republicans should look around and see who they're with. In their quest for unfettered power, they have surrounded themselves with anti-intellectual, anti-science, law-breaking, bigoted, racist predators. Their team anarchy, team insurrection, the party with congressmen calling for people to be armed and dangerous, who support pedophiles and people who ignored hundreds of boys being molested and do keynote speeches at white power rallies. The party that calls for one religion, bans protests, and whose slogan is a euphemism for fuck the president. After the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict came down and everybody saw the radicalized boy who brought a gun to a BLM protest, killed two people and walk, Republican Florida Congressman Anthony Sabatini doubled down on his colleagues' offers for internships for the white power symbol throwing, proud boy emulating, free as fuck t-shirt wearing teenager by demanding that Congress pass legislation proclaiming November 19th officially Kyle Rittenhouse Day. Now, of course... This is just some desperate hanger on or please notice me trolling by the congressman designed to deliberately incite outrage from the left. But this is also our government. These people represent us. How we behave, how we handle ourselves, how the world perceives us, it's all through the lens of the leaders we elected to stand in for us. And if you're a Republican, is this really what you want to be associated with? Is this truly what you stand for? Even in the very best case scenario, if you buy that this child armed with a weapon of war went out of state to protect property of people he didn't know and give medical aid he had yet to learn, ended up shooting unarmed people in pure self-defense, why would you want to name a day after him? That's a pretty sick thing to do. As the brilliant Maya Angelou said, when people show you who they are, believe them. And the modern day Republican Party shows us every day who they are, and they do it at the expense of the lives and health of the American people and the life and health of the American experiment. Remember, this is the same party that removed Liz Cheney, daughter of revered Republican operative and shadow president Dick Cheney, from her leadership position for daring to hold Trump accountable. Cheney voted with Trump 93% of the time when he was in office. She's a lifelong committed conservative, a warmongering, low-tax, small-government, anti-choice, classic Republican. But under the new regime, she's out. There is no room for dissent in Trump's GOP. No room for individual thought. The party replaced powerhouse Cheney with small-fry mean girl Elise Stefanik, someone whose voting record was far less in line with Trump's agenda, but who had proved herself to be loyal and without scruples. Perfect for a party that no longer cares about policy but performance. When it came right down to it, Stefanik would lie for Trump and Cheney would not, and that is how the decision was made. And if you think the Republican rod is contained to national politics, think again. Cheney's own state party in Wyoming doubled down on her removal from federal leadership to vote to remove her completely from the Wyoming GOP. She was kicked out of her own party, the party she was a legacy in, for the crime of telling the truth. The truth that the election was not stolen and Donald Trump lost fair and square. But if you somehow missed it, both around the country or during this podcast, truth, facts, and the rule of law have no place in the modern GOP. When there is no room for any truth but the leader's truth, when you organize yourself around the cult of a leader, 
when you cheer and die for the lies you're told, when you refuse to accept the facts unless they support your beliefs, when your leaders work outside of elections to gain power and suppress the votes of their enemies and detractors, you are no longer a Democratic Party. And we pretend they are for our own comfort to our detriment. Look no further than the 13 House Republicans who voted for the infrastructure bill. The bill will be an incredible job creator, and it's a long overdue investment in our country. Every Republican should have voted for it. And the fact that only 13 had the balls to stand up and do it should terrify us. Because the Republicans have chosen Democratic failure over American success. And those Republicans that chose the American people over their party line, they're pariahs. Leadership is chosen to shun and malign them. There's talk of removing them from committees and primering them at home. These people are having their entire careers threatened for having the audacity to vote for something Donald Trump himself promised to do but couldn't deliver. So the man who glorified violence against his coworker deserves a better committee appointment, but the lawmakers who voted to invest in our power grid should be fired? What have the Republicans allowed themselves to become? Steve Schmidt says, what strikes me is how much more extreme and broken our politics have become since the Trump coup and the black hole of nothingness where there should be focus and passion around defending American democracy. He then talks about a story where Desmond Tutu, the famous South African human rights activist, was asked whether evil was more powerful than good. And he said, no, but it's better organized. And Schmidt notes that feels pretty poignant at this moment in American history and questions how far the American people are going to let it all go. That ultimately it is up to us to decide if we're ready to abandon the American experiment and our dream of a just society where life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness applies to all, or whether we're going to stand up and fight for it. So stop voting for the letter beside a candidate's name. Stop allowing your family and friends and acquaintances to follow a party for what they think it stands for and encourage them to pay attention to what they actually stand for. Because if you look beyond Team Red versus Team Blue to the actions and words and behaviors of the candidates and party leaders, I think you will see that the blue team may be banged up, but the red team as you know it is gone. They no longer exist, and they've been replaced with something terrifying. Think of a horror movie where a loved one becomes a zombie. They can't be fixed. They won't change back, and you have to let them go or they will kill you. The person you knew isn't there anymore. They're now a danger to you and your family, and you have to distance yourself to save yourself. That is the Republican Party of today. Vicious and dangerous with no care of who they hurt or destroy in their quest for domination. They want a non-thinking horde to follow them, and you have to think more of yourself than to just assimilate into such a horrifying version of America. Vote for what's best for your family. Vote for your values. Vote for the health and well-being of your nation. Stop buying into the idea that the Republicans are going to take the House in 22. Why should they? What are they running on? What do they stand for? We need to buck up and do better and be better and get more votes and convince more people. Choose the fight. The Democrats are going to fight. True patriotic Republicans like Schmidt and Cheney are going to fight. Individual citizens like me are going to fight. What are you going to do? Because the zombies can't win. And frankly, you have to stop listening to the media. Because the humans are actually way ahead. We just have to keep going. So that's it for this week. Feel encouraged that we have leadership out here passing bills to show us they care. Mourn for the Republican Party and what it used to be and prepare yourself to move beyond them so we can build a democracy that works for everyone. Now go out and make the world better. Don't name women after Wizarding World Sport Balls and get ready to fight. 2022 is just around the corner and I love you guys for caring enough to be here. See you next week. Until then, PG out. The Politics Girl podcast was written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved. Ta-da.